Now let's go on to grading lobes. Now I showed you where grading lobes occurred and what I'm going to do is go to a different coordinate system to examine visually the effect the grading lobes have uh, on a three a, a two dimensional uh, a planar array, and when we're looking above at at, at different angles, okay, and the and different directions that we the main beam is pointing. You, 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 there's not an easy way mathematically, you can do it the mathematically, of course, but there's not an easy way to see it as I've understood it, except people pretty much use this method to understand it. Now let's first dis define a spherical coordinate system for studying grading lobes. It's our typical spherical coordinate system, a z-axis, an x-axis, a y-axis. We have uh, a theta being the angle down from the z-axis to the direction of the array main lobe and the uh, units and the phi is the direction from the x-axis over to the plane uh, where the uh, direction of the main lobe drops onto the x-y plane. Now we project that coordinate system onto the xy plane from above. And what we do is we end up with a space that's direction cosine space. It's called the uv space, where u is in this direction and V is in this direction. Now, theta equals zero is at the origin here and theta equals to 90 degrees is on the circle. Phi equals zero is the direction around the U axis. And it's 90 degrees when it's vertical. Here it's 180 degrees and here it's 270. It's the direction cosines. Now this is, I'll take the next step. If we take I'm going to leave up tri a triangular grid of elements because I'm going to point out later, later, that you can more efficiently save elements. I think it's 17 or 18 percent fewer if you space your elements triangularly. But we're going to deal with looking at the rectangular grid of elements where the, the, these blue circles represent where an element is, is physically. And, and, and that's in the VU plane as we look down on it. Okay? And in that VU plane, uh, Inside of this circle is physical space. Outside of it, um, it, it, it you, you get cosines and sines uh, uh, angles greater than 1 or minus 1. The magnitude of them greater than 1 or minus 1. So this is the physical space. And our equation for the lobes, the lobes are a function of these integers, they'll appear at these integers, P and Q, where they run from 0 to on out. And U0 would be the direction cosine that you're pointing in, and lambda over 
in, in dx and dy are the spacing, and p's and q's are the integers. Okay, now let's look for the simplest case. No visible grading lobes. We've got our, our uh, distance between elements at, at, as lambda over 2. So you see the dx, the dx here, is lambda over 2. And here we have uh, a bro we're broadside. And we have no grading lobes. In the, the red circles are grading lobes. And we have none of them in physical space. And for D, you just plug in to these numbers, lambda over 2, and D, dx equals dy equals lambda over 2, and you get 2p comma 2q, and you place circles at all those points. And what you get is you just get at 0, 0, 1 inside the, the physical space. Now, if we go to d equals dx equals dy equals lambda, we get these equations say that grading lobes will appear at, at, at u sub p and v sub q equal to p and q. They'll be at every integer place on this matrix. And, and grading lobes will be seen with the beam pointing broadside here on the edges. Now, if we scan the array and say uh, grading lobes are visible as the pattern shifts to the right. Now, here, theta is equal to 0, and phi is equal to 0, and that is right here. And if we shift theta to 90 degrees, and, and phi to 0, that shifts the beam, And you'll see the grading lobes have, have become visible as the pattern shifts to the right. OK? So here's the main lobe, and you get it just barely in that edge. For, tri for grading lobes in, in, with triangular spacing, you have the same formula. And the triangular grid uses 14%. I was a little uh, uh, high on the saving. They need about 14% less than with a square grid. The exact percentage of savings depends on the scan requirements of the array. And there are no grading lobes for scan angles less than 60 degrees. And for a rectangular grid, a half wavelength spacing, no grading lobes are visible for all scan angles. Now I'd like to do something that I generally always like to do in my lectures. I've, give, I've shown you stuff and uh, equations. Now, here we have a radar, and this is the face looking at from the bottom of that radar of, of, of cross-dipole elements at an angle. And they go up, and there are thousands in this circular face. OK? And this is a, a ballistic missile early warning radar system at Filing Steel in the United Kingdom. And it's been upgraded now. It's called the UEWR, Upgraded Early Warning System. But these are the face, these are the uh, uh, transmitting elements. Underneath each of these is a transmitter and receiver. These are the antennas. And you can see. They're in a triangular grid. 
Um, I hardly believe Raytheon would put things in a rectangular grid need to build more. <laughs> um, now, do all these phase elements so close to each other uh, transmit and receive without influencing each other? That's why I bring this up, because we're going to talk about mutual coupling issues. When this guy transmits out energy, how does this guy of conductor being this close affect the energy pattern that goes out? And here, again, to, to preface the mutual coupling issues, is the Cobra Dane radar in Shemya, Alaska. And here's a close-up of its face. You can see how large it is. This is the, uh, the, the ladder that people climb up, and then it moves over if they want to do something with one of the elements. And you can see that these are all triangularly spaced. But they're not dipole elements. They're a different type of element. And again, the same question. So let's look and see just what's going on here. Now, this is a view graph where we draw a, a, we have one antenna element next to another one. And what I want to do is focus on the fact, just let me check one thing. Nope. I'm just going to have to rely on colors. Let's just look at the blue dotted, the dotted arrows where the element transmits. Here's a phase shifter. And we've got a, a little transmit receive module here. Or, uh, and then it goes up. And then it not only transmits out, but it transmits over and is received by this antenna next to it. It's too close not to be affected. And some of that goes into this antenna and then is affected in this system and that effect comes out as adding to the effect of the solid in and out. Uh, the, the solid lines would would be the, uh, the 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 motion of the electric field of the one of the elements, the M or the N, and the dash, the other one. So what you've got to do is analyze in phased arrays. Uh, you can do it. Um, it's based on simple models. The, all the analysis we've done so far where there's no, no more interaction between radiating elements. But mutual coupling, this effect that I just showed you, and you could see how close those elements were in those two radars, they, they will affect one another. The current in one element depends on the amplitude of, and current phase of the current in the next element nearby. And, and, and notice this is just a two-dimensional pattern. You've got triangular patterns as well as the element in the pattern, the current in the element under consideration. And when the antenna, uh, when things are scanned broadside, the mutual coupling can change the antenna gain, the beam shape, side lobe level, and radiation pattern. And in rare cases, mutual coupling can cause what's known as scan blindness. So in addition, mutual coupling can sometimes be exploited to achieve certain performance requirements. What I want to do in this view graph is to point out that this mutual coupling effect has to be looked at very carefully when designing phase array radars. And these effects are studied with smaller, you just don't build an array antenna on paper and say that's the way it'll let react the interaction will be when we have it all thousands of elements built. You usually will build a small breadboard of a dozen or so by a dozen or so and examine the mutual coupling effects and design the elements such that the effects will help you rather than hurt you. Okay, now uh, let's go on to phase shifters 
and radiating elements.